Okay, I hope you're all ready and excited to forge into the federal tax code because that's where we're headed with this unit. Um, to be honest, I love teaching this stuff. It's fascinating. And in fact, I find most of my students have some aha moments when we go through this because you're going to encounter things that will explain the way nonprofits work that you maybe didn't know or understand before. So you'll experience something we talk about in this unit and say, ah, now I understand why this happens or that happens. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. Um, in this first class session, we're going to be talking about tax exemption under the federal tax code. I want you to understand how corporate income taxes work and why nonprofit tax exemption is significant. I want you to understand the economic value and costs of exempting nonprofits from the income tax. And then I want you to know and articulate the difference between these four categories of tax exemption, 501c3, c4, c6, and section 527 organizations. Don't let those intimidate you. They're easy to understand. Okay, let's talk about the corporate income tax exemption. So this is how corporate income taxes work. Um, if you look at the, the little um, graphic on the right-hand side, every corporation makes money. And that's represented by the height of my graphic. So the whole thing is the amount of money that the organization brought in. But then in the course of making money, corporations also spend money. Those, those, those are called expenses. And as long as they're legitimate business expenses, the IRS doesn't actually tax them. The only thing that a corporation pays taxes on is its profit. And so if you'll notice well, the top bar right there is the profit um, of the or that the organization saw, which is to say it's income above expenses. That's what's taxable under our corporate tax code. So what that means is if you don't pay, make a profit, you don't pay income taxes as a corporation. And expenses can include all kinds of things related to running business, like marketing, uh, employee salaries, um, inventory costs, infrastructure improvements, all kinds of things like that. But this also means, and this is important, an unprofitable business, so a business that's spending more money than it's making, is functionally tax exempt. So if your business doesn't make a profit, then you never actually have to pay taxes as a corporation. This is why whenever I talk with people um, that I'm meeting and they ask what I do, I, I tell them that I'm in the business school and that I teach um, in the public management program, I teach classes on nonprofit organizations. And then it happens a lot where people say, oh, my business is nonprofit, right? Because they're joking that their business doesn't make any money. Well, the, the, the funniest part of that joke, well, not funny, I guess, for them, but they don't have to pay taxes on those profits. So functionally, they're like a nonprofit in the sense that they don't pay taxes um, just as a nonprofit corporation doesn't pay taxes. But I want you to stop and think of what you would do if you could um, – if you could make profits without having to pay taxes, what would you do with that money? See, that's the boat that nonprofits are in. They can make profits year to year without ever paying any taxes to the federal government on those profits. What would you do with money if you had if you if you had that untaxed profit? Um, you know, there are lots of different kinds of things you might do. Um, the one thing you can't do if you're a nonprofit, you remember, is you can't distribute that money to shareholders. So that means you're going to have to spend it on your corporate purposes. And that might be to expand programs, products, and services. You might invest in infrastructure improvements. You might save for future risks and opportunities. But the point is, is you try to find some valuable use for this um, for, for this untaxed profit. Um, and, and that's an important question to ask because that is the concept behind giving tax exemption to nonprofit organizations. If we give them excess profits in the form of not having to pay taxes, the idea is that they'll hopefully spend that money in a way that deepens their public benefit. They'll expand their programs, they'll invest in infrastructure, they'll save for downtimes, but the point is, is it will broaden and stabilize the public benefit that they're providing to society. Let's dig into the economics of this to make sense of it. Um, we're going to kind of breeze through this a little bit and then we'll dig into a more in class together. But in, in my chart here, what you see is a normal market, right? The downward sloping blue line is the demand curve. The upward sloping green line is the supply curve. Where those two curves meet is the amount of quantity that's going to be produced in whatever it is. So let's say it's healthcare or education, right? A certain amount of education is going to be produced. That's the Q star at the bottom. And it's going to be priced at a certain price, which is P star on the left. 
And this is a normal market. This is how norm this is how markets sort of ideally behave without any influence. But we don't we don't actually live and work in markets like that. Markets are constantly being altered by outside forces, and one of those forces is a tax. Now, there are a lot of different ways to tax. This chart illustrates a tax that's imposed on the sellers of of a good or service um, based on a per quantity rate. So the green line was the original supply curve. Well, the yellow line is now the new supply curve imposed by a tax. And what that the shape of that curve basically means is that for each item they produce, they owe a certain tax. Now, this is not a perfect analogy to the way we tax corporations today in the sense that corporations today are taxed on profits, not total income. But uh, it illustrates the basic idea that as you increase a tax on a supplier, their cost of production goes up. And if their cost of production goes up, then everything they sell becomes more expensive. And that's what the yellow line moving up means, is that their production is more expensive than before. So they so for the same quantity of goods before, it now costs them more to make it. Well, that being the case, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an effect on the market. And the way that the tax affects the market is it reduces the quantity produced and raises the price as a result. Um, again, we'll dig into this more in class, but uh, the, on the left-hand side, you see where it says the tax, that difference between the original price production point and the new price production point under the tax, um, that's uh, like that space between PT and the lower line there, that's the amount of, t of tax that the, that the tax, that's the amount of money that the tax generates. Um, the red triangle, hopefully you remember that that's called dead weight loss, and that's the amount of producer and, sub and, uh, and consumer surplus that are lost because of the tax. Uh, we'll dig into this together in class to make more sense of it. But what you can know is dead weight loss is bad. It means less happiness for consumers and less profit for providers, for for suppliers. So, so this is what happens when you impose a tax on an industry, say healthcare education. Well, now here's the question: What happens if you remove the tax for some people, but not all people? So some of the producers are now tax free, but other producers are not. Well, this is what happens. You now have two supply curves going on. You have the yellow one, which is the supply curve for the people that still for the producers that still have to pay a tax. And then you have the green one, which is the supply curve for the producers that are now tax exempt. Well, what that does is it drives the price back down to where the the original price line was and the original quantity. And that's because the nonprofit organizations here that are tax exempt can make up for the previous problems. Um, and then there's going to be a special amount of quantity that's produced by the uh, suppliers that are still taxed. So they'll produce up to a certain amount, but they can't make as much as the nonprofit people can make. So um, that green shaded area right there, that reflects the, ink, the profit or producer surplus that goes to the, to the nonprofit or tax-exempt entities that are selling the good or service. Now, again, we're going to dig through these charts together in class, but I want to get your brains kind of spinning about them. I know this clicks for some of you and not for the others, and that's okay. We'll cover the concept clearly in class together. But uh, the point I want to make is that this predicts something interesting. It predicts that if you have an industry where some of the competitors are tax-exempt and some of them are not tax-exempt, then the tax-exempt competitors, should there should be more of them, and they should be producing more than the non-tax-exempt competitors. So I want you to think of industries where you have taxable entities and, and tax-exempt entities competing against each other in the same industry. Think of like education and healthcare, for example. This chart predicts that there will be more nonprofit competitors than there are for-profit competitors in the space. And if you look at education and healthcare, that is true. There are more nonprofit hospitals than there are for-profit hospitals. The same is true in universities. There are more nonprofit universities than there are for-profit universities. And so this predicts, this chart shows us that that happens and why it happens. It happens because the nonprofit competitors get excess profits that they don't have to pay taxes on, not just because it's tax-free, but because the tax changes the amount of quantity that the taxable people can produce. And that means that we're basically handing over free market share 
to the tax exempt entities. Now we're okay with this because they don't have shareholders to to distribute the profits to, but that's the basic idea. So we're going to discuss this in class and its policy implications and and all kinds of other things. But that's the basic idea. So let's now step over and we're going to talk about categories of tax exempt status. Now, as I told you on the first day of class, there are over thirty different categories of tax exemption. Being the merciful, wonderful wise person I am. I'm not going to make you learn all 30 of those categories. Most of them are very, very narrow, um, and you'll never encounter them in your life. But uh, there are four that you will encounter and that are worth knowing about. The first one is 501c3, which is a category tax exemption that pretty much all of you know. The next is 501c4, which we'll talk about. 501c6, which is in that list of the 30 categories. And then we actually step outside of the 501c code section to section 527, and we'll talk about what those are. So just a few initial observations. 501c status is based on section 501c of the federal tax code, which is part of the reading. And so if you if you go to section 501c in the tax code, you can read through all these categories of tax and status. There are 28, oh, I think I should have changed that number. Uh, that number might be wrong, but there are, there are around 28 to 30 different categories of tax exempt status under Section 501c. There's only one status, 501c3, that's actually considered a charitable. So this is the only status where where um, where it's actually considered charitable status, and and that term charity matters because it determines some important things about the way your organization is treated. So let's talk about that charitable status first. So these are charitable organizations, C3s. Some of the, some of the interesting attributes of C3s are, for example, if you're a charity, um, you're not allowed to engage in any political campaigns, and you're only allowed to participate in insubstantial lobbying. And so you can lobby on, on legislation and social issues, but not very much. It can't be a substantial part of your activity. And in addition to that, you cannot participate in any political campaigns or endorse political candidates. Um, but the benefit, the most substantial benefit of being a charity is that when people make donations to you, then their donations are tax deductible. And this is the only kind of entity where that's true. So you can give your money to a C4, a C6, a 527, a C5, a C18, it doesn't really matter where you give your money. None of those options are going to allow you to deduct the gift or donation from your personal income taxes. But if you give your money to a C3, then that's when you actually can deduct your income from, deduct the donation from your income taxes. So the tax benefit goes both ways because the C3 is tax exempt, so they don't pay taxes on their profits. But then if you're a C3, that means all of your donors also get to deduct the donations from their taxes, which means they get a tax benefit as well. So there is kind of a double tax benefit if you're a charity that doesn't exist for other types of nonprofit entities. 501c4s are civic leagues, uh, employee associations. They're generally described as what we call social welfare organizations. So these are entities that are promoting social welfare that are not necessarily considered charitable. Um, these are things like advocacy groups, so the NRA, the ACLU, the NAACP, those are all 501c4 organizations. You don't make a donation to the NRA, if you've ever noticed. You actually, with the NRA, you buy a membership. Um, and if you made a donation to the NRA, it wouldn't be tax deductible because what the NRA does is not charitable. The same is true of the ACLU and the NAACP. Now, the NAACP does have a scholarship program that tax, that's tax exempt, but that's separate. So the advantage of being a 501c, so this might raise the question, why would you ever want to be a C4 instead of a C3 if donations are not tax deductible? Well, the reason is because there are no explicit limits on lobbying or participating in political campaigns. So that means as a C4, you can be very active lobbying-wise and politically. Now, there is a limit that you can't spend more than 50% of your revenue, or sorry, of your income on, more than 50% of your expenses cannot be spent on a political campaign, like, a sp like supporting a specific political candidate. But that said, you could, for example, put out ads that are issue ads, where you would say, you know, um, this election, make sure you consider religious freedom, or this election, make sure you think about whatever. And, and they might even try to sort of paint the different candidates as being favoring or against the policy that you're promoting. 
These are not technically political campaigns. They're called issue ads, and there are no limits on how much money a, a C4 spends on an issue ad. It's just that if they're going to donate to a political campaign or run ads for a candidate, um, then uh, they can't spend more than 50% of their expenses on that activity. So because they're so politically and sort of lo like liberal this way and that they can not liberal not liberal in the sense you know right or left on the political spectrum but liberal liberal in the sense that they're sort of unhindered in the way they spend their money these are have become a very popular um, alternative to political action committees so PACs and super PACs uh, are sort of like uh, they're they're a way that people put their money together to spend in support of a candidate uh, 501c4s have become a really popular alternative in fact one of the things that makes them most popular is that with a super PAC you have to identify all of your political donors um, with the 501c4 you don't so if you if you're in the mood to influence a political campaign and you're really wealthy but you don't want anybody to know that it was you that's what a c4 gives you now this is a recent development because of a, 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 a supreme court case called citizens united where the court said that limitations on corporate political spending are unconstitutional and that was a really influential decision and it's it caused 501c4s to become super popular the the number of applications for 501c4 status more than doubled after that court ruling all these people wanted to create c4s because it meant that they could spend money <clears throat> in political activity but not have to tell people where the money came from okay this is obviously super controversial the IRS right now is considering alternative rules to sort of better describe the way they think C4s should operate. And the reason is because they're not, they weren't intended by Congress to be political groups. They were intended to be social welfare groups pr to promoting a certain issue like gun, gun rights or um, constitutional, other constitutional rights with the ACLU or, or educate the public on other, other certain issues. None of that is obviously, um, None of that is obviously the case if you're just promoting a specific political candidate. And, and, and so the IRS is trying to sort of draw better boundaries. Okay, a C6 is what the code calls a business league. Um, the more popular term for them is a trade association. The Motion Picture Association of America is an example of that. So all the movie studios pay membership dues to this MPAA organization, and the organization lobbies on their behalf, mostly promoting really strong copyright laws, for example. The NFL is a business league. In fact, the code specifically exempts professional football leagues from taxes under this code section. Uh, there are actually thousands of, of trade associations, and they essentially lobby on behalf of their constituents. And, and there's a bad bad rap out there for trade associations, but there are a lot of really good ones. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, there are groups representing nurses or grocers or, I don't know, like like the kind of stuff that we are, well, it's, it's just, it's only fair that they have a voice, um, a collective voice uh, when they're trying to persuade Congress. And so that's how these organizations work. So they are allowed to lobby and support political campaigns, largely with the same uh, general limits as a C4. Um, and as a result, they're a very common form of lobbying group. So all the members of an industry will pay dues to this group that then lobbies on their behalf before Congress. Some of you may have opportunities to work for trade associations, um, and now you'll know what they are. Okay, a Section 527 organization is not under the 501C section of the code. So this is tax exempt under a totally different premise. Uh, these are essentially political parties and political action committees. The idea is that if you're going to be spending money running for Congress, then we shouldn't be taxing you on, uh, on, on that money that's being spent. Um, so with your money being spent on political action, like running a campaign, the IRS won't tax it, it but uh, the only, they only won't tax the money spent on your political activity. So as long as this money is dedicated toward a political campaign, then you're totally fine. So if you start spending it on stuff that has nothing to do with a political campaign, like running a gas station, that's when the IRS will step in and say, hey, that's not political activity. We're going to start taxing your profits. Um, 
and it's important to emphasize that this is uh, this is where most people donate when they donate to a campaign. It usually goes to a 527, and those donations are not tax deductible. So if you make a donation to a political candidate, you don't get to deduct it from your taxes. I think this is one of the things that makes it hard for candidates to raise money. If they could get tax deductible donations um, to run their campaigns, we'd be seeing a lot more donations to political campaigns. But that said, you know, not taxing it means we're essentially subsidizing it. And so we're, we'd be subsidizing a lot of political speech, and that's probably not the intent of the tax code. It's probably better spent on social, on uh, sort of public goods. Um, now, th that's a brief review of all four of those categories. Um, one thing that's generally true for all 501c entities is that there's a prohibition on something called private benefit to individuals in a way that's often called inurement. Now, that's a weird word. It's probably one you've never heard before. It's, it's specifically defined in the tax code. We're going to be getting to it in a, in a later class session and describing inurement. We're going to talk about all the ways that people improperly can benefit from nonprofit dedicated resources, tax-exempt resources. And those improper benefits are going to be the subject of a whole class session. But that said, this is just important for you to understand now that if you're going to be a 501c, you probably are limited from this by this concept of inurement, meaning you can't let private people benefit in non-tax exempt ways. Uh, so if you just compare all of these groups in a simple chart, this is what you get. Um, you'll see that all of them are tax exempt, except with 527s, it's only the exempt function money, meaning the political money. Um, the only group that gets tax deductible contributions is the 501c3 groups. They have inurement restrictions across the board, except 527s don't really have inurement restrictions. And the reason is because if you're spending the money in a way that's benefiting privately and not a political campaign, then you're going to be taxed anyway. So the inurement rules don't really matter there. Um, and as far as political activity goes, you'll notice that all of the groups pretty much can do what they want politically and lobbying-wise, except for C3s. And C3, C C3s are only allowed to engage in what's called insubstantial lobbying. And they cannot engage in any political campaigns or endorse political candidates. So that's session uh, 2.1. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all in class.